morning, good afternoon. It's still morning. Good morning, everyone. Excuse my croaky voice. I do have a cold. My name is Musumola Falake Abudu. I'm sure most of you probably know me as Mo Abudu. Um, you know, the, the story as to how my name became Mo is, um, is, is, a, is a long story in itself. My oriki is Ajifowoke. Now, I don't know if any of us here know what an oriki is. But um, an oriki is something I think we should all be very proud of as Africans, as Nigerians, as a Yoruba person. I believe most of us do have an oriki. And what I find quite amazing is when my mom calls me and she says, Omomi, Musumola, Ajifowoke, you know, and it's, I mean, I think these are some of the things that we must never lose focus of as Nigerians, as Africans, as Yoruba people. These are things that I think we need to continue to teach one generation to the next, the importance of this culture. Most of you that may not know, I'm 51 years old. I am the mother of two young adults, a 25-year-old and a 19-year-old. I love my children to bits, of course. Um, I am a lover of God. I think for me, everything that I have, everything that I will become, everything that I am, it's purely by his grace. I'm also known as a serial entrepreneur. And you may ask, what on earth is that? We've heard of serial killers and serial adulterers and serial other things. I guess it's when you do something time and time again. And for me, you know, what I have done with my life really is to do the things that I am most passionate about at the point of being able to do them. Some people like to do the same thing for the longest time. You may want to be a banker. You may want to be a model. You may want to be a singer. You may want to be a business tycoon in doing different things. But for me, I just find that it's about being in the moment. And what I have found is that whenever I am in the moment, whatever it is that I am doing, I am absolutely absorbed by it. I'm most passionate about that particular thing. But when I look at my own particular journey, I believe that one thing has led me to the next thing. So it's really about putting all the building blocks together. I started my career in the United Kingdom. I worked on a, one of the largest exhibitions in the UK. I was responsible from beginning to end of that exhibition. I'm a HR practitioner by trade, by the way. I also manage one of the largest HR recruiting firms in the UK before I came back to Nigeria. On my return to Nigeria, I worked one of the largest multinational oil and gas multinationals in Nigeria. And after about 10 years of working as head of HR, I decided it was time for me to move on and to do my own thing. And everybody thought I was pretty crazy, you know. And of course, you know, there's always going to be the fear of should I do this thing and should I take this step at this point in time. But for me, after having worked 9 to 5 in Nigeria for about 10 years and having done it for several other years in the UK, I felt it was time for me to become this entrepreneur. So I stepped out of my comfort zone and I set up my own HR consulting practice. So of course I had to take the plunge and I resigned and I was thinking, oh my goodness, should I really have done this? But once you've done it, you know what? There's no going back. I had resigned. I had to find an office. I had to employ staff and I set up Vic Lawrence and Associates. And from running Vic Lawrence, I was very happy and very comfortable running VLA, but I still felt like there was something more for me to do. So after having spent about seven, eight years running Vic Lawrence and Associates, I decided that it was time for me to take this journey into the world of media. But before I took the journey into the world of media whilst running VLA, I also felt it was time to add something to the hospitality and the conferencing. The Protea Hotel Oakwood Park was set up as a specialist hotel for conferences, for training, for retreats, um, all those that wanted to ensure that they could run their businesses away from their businesses and run their retreats and their training programs would come to the Protea Hotel, Protea Hotel Oakwood Park. And that's exactly what it was set up for. And that was set up about two or three years after I set up VLA. And again, I felt that there was a white space that had to be filled. And that is why the Protea Hotel Oakwood Park was set up. But I soon got itchy feet again. And I felt it was time to move on to do what I would think would be the next best thing. And I think for the longest time and deeply buried in my subconsciousness has been this need to tell the African story. Now this is going to be probably the 
the, not, I wouldn't say the most exciting, but it was going to be the biggest leap of faith that I was going to have to take to ensure that I could really tell the African story. So the most important thing for me at that point in time was, okay, Mo, you have this deep-seated belief in your mind, in your conscience, that you need to change this narrative. I had no prior media experience. I had only ever worked in HR, oil and gas, more administrative functions. And here I was now having to step out into the world of media. So the very, very first thing I did was to obviously do as much research as possible into how am I going to take this leap. And I decided that the only way in which I could contribute at that point in time was to be the face. So for me, taking that leap of faith into the world of media, I had to really sort of gather my thoughts and decide on how I was going to make that happen. What were the things I was going to have to do? As I said, this is something that I believe has been deeply buried in my subconsciousness for the longest time. I was born in England. I came back to Nigeria at age seven, lived with my grandmother in Ondo, went back to England at age 11. So you can see that obviously I've had both the English and the African um, sort of understanding of what it is to be a person living in the UK and a person living in Nigeria, living in Ondo to be precise. And I'm using the word person because am I Nigerian? Am I British? What am I? But I've always, even though I was born in the UK and I may carry a British passport as well as a Nigerian passport, I do strongly believe that I am a Nigerian. And that is where I wish to be identified with. And that's who I do believe that I am. As I said, my Oriki is Ajifowoke. I don't think there's any British person out there with such an Oriki. <laughs> so here is this journey that I am on. So the most important thing for me was to decide on that leap of faith that I was going to take. And it started with setting up Moments with Mo. Moments with Mo is a talk show that is now in its 10th year. At the point of taking on the decision to start Moments with Mo, I had no media experience whatsoever. So here I am. I want to share my story, our story collectively with the world, and I had no prior experience on how to do this. And I'm hearing this whisper saying to me, Mo, I want you to go out there and start this talk show. I want you to speak on behalf of Africa. I want you to speak on behalf of Nigeria. I want you to showcase the greatness of this continent. I want you to show the other reality that exists. Because often, I've coined a phrase called the five Ds. We're often described, we're often seen as a continent full of despair, deceit, destruction, destitution. These are the th things that we have been known to be associated with. Even if you look at the Americas and you look all over the world, if you even look at how movies are made about Africa, it's always about war or genocide or some other illness or some other D or the other. If it's not disaster, it's children starving, it's one thing or the other always. Why are we allowing this to define us? Why are we allowing this to be our story? But no one can tell our stories the way we can. No one can tell your story the way you can tell your story. No one can tell my story the way I can tell my own particular story. So therefore, I felt that it was partly my responsibility to take it upon myself to go out there and start to tell a story. And I started that journey in 2006 with Moments with Mo. Don't forget having no prior experience. But being a HR practitioner, I did what I would advise a client or anyone else to do, go and get trained on how to become this thing and how to do this thing. So yes, I went through weeks and weeks and weeks of watching all sorts of talk shows from Oprah to the Ellen DeGeneres show to the Parkinson show. I watched and I watched and I watched and then I went on training courses in the UK 
and then I came back and then I had a facilitator in Nigeria, one of my best trainers, Tony Osime, and week after week, I would sit in front of a camera and I would recite, hello and welcome to Moments with Mo today. And I would get it right and I would get it wrong, would play back the tapes until I got it right. And I'm still working. I'm still work in progress. And I think we're all work in progress. But I think the most important thing is to take that step and to step out there and to be counted. And I took that decision that I was going to stand out there and I was going to be counted. Now, one of the other, I mean, I know that today's talk has been titled, When You Hear the Word Africa, What Do You Think? So I've, having started my Moments with Mo journey, I think into about the second year of Moments with Mo, I took a trip to the UK and I stood on a street corner. I had a particular episode I called, What Do You Think When You Hear the Word Africa? So I stood in a very popular part of London, central London, a place called Marble Arch, sort of like probably Tinumbu here or somewhere in Saleh, Kohe equivalent, where there are loads of people passing up and down. And I had a microphone in my hand. And I just basically, and a cameraman was there, of course. And then I would stop anyone that would listen to me. And I would say, sorry, could I, you know, could I interview you for a few minutes? And they would say, sure. And then I'll say, how oh, hi, my name's Moabudu. You know, I'm here. You know, I really want to ask you what you think of Africa. Da, 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 da. My question to you is, when you hear the word Africa, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word Africa? And the responses I heard were giraffe. HIV, starving babies with flies on their face, poverty, not poverty, poverty. Poverty is, I don't know if you know what a Cockney accent is, but a Cockney accent is someone that probably grew up on the east end of London, and they themselves don't really have a good understanding of the English language, but they try. So they will not say poverty, they will say poverty. So in this particular, this particular person I stopped said poverty. I said, okay, poverty, okay. So this went on and on and on. I think the nicest response that I got back was that sunshine. Yes, it was sun, yes. If I remember correctly, it was sunshine. Yes, the sun shines in Africa. Then another person said, Mugabe, when they hear the word Africa, the first thing that comes to his mind is Mugabe. You know, so I was thinking, ah, now wow, is this how they've described our continent? Not our country, because some people still think Africa is a country. Is this how we're being described? Okay. My next question was, why do you think this? Why do you think poverty first? Why do you think Mugabe first? Why do you think HIV first? Why do you think starving babies with flies on their face first? Their response was, it's what I read in the newspapers. It's what I see on television. It's what I hear on radio. You can't blame them, right? It's what they see that they're going to think. So if that is what is out there in mainstream media, then that is what the world is going to know of your beloved continent. That is what the world is going to know of you as a person of Africa. That is what the world is going to know of your brand. No matter how big the brand is, you're building a big bank, you're building an insurance company, you're building a fashion line, whatever it is you're building, you have been defined as poverty-stricken, you have been defined as HIV infested, etc., etc. That is your continent. So don't you think we have a joint responsibility to do something about this? But often, I do shine the light on some of the things that may, may not be so good as well. Things like domestic abuse, which I think is an issue that has to be dealt with. And in issues like that, I praise the women that come out and talk about how they've gone from being a victim to being a victor. Nonetheless, we're putting Africa on the map globally. So here I am on my Moments with Mo journey. And I'm going about, and yes, year after year, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. But then again, being the serial entrepreneur in me, something springs to mind and says, Mo, what is the next thing for you to do? And that whisper comes into my mind, yet again into my ear. The whisper comes again, and it is Mo, go and make Ebony Life TV a reality. Go out there and make Ebony Life TV a reality. This has been a four-year journey. We have made programming from drama to reality to talk to lifestyle. But what I often find with Western media is there's no balance. They're not interested in coming here to see the things that are working and those things that look absolutely amazing. It's always going to be about somebody that is starving and has no food and has no water. 
you know? I mean, I get to the airport when I'm traveling, and you're go you can buy a bag at Heathrow that says, buy this bag for one pound and save an African child from, uh, for, give an African child what now? And I'm thinking, hello? Do you know how many people live in Africa? I'm not saying that people don't have people starving in Africa, but there are people starving on the streets of London. There are people starving on the streets of, of, of the, uh, on different parts of the United States as well. But why must the focus always be on that in our continent? We must start to shine the light on the things that are working to encourage us and also to show the world that we are capable. And that is the journey we are on. So last year, I woke up again and said it's time. I have not let go of Ebony Life TV, but we launched Ebony Life Films. And Ebony Life Films has made its first film and it's called 50. And for those of you that have not yet seen the trailer online, please go to www.50themovie.com. And it's a movie about four Nigerian women, but four Nigerian women of today. Because if you go on Google and you say, give me an image of an African woman, you don't want to know what comes up. It's not me. You see these high heels and my hair and the, mm -mm. it's going to be some woman. Maybe she's not, if she's even probably has no top. Her breasts are hanging. She has one wrapper. Maybe something on her head or a child on her back. I am not saying that is not us, but that is not all there is to us. For those of you that have not seen the trailer for 50, please kindly go out and, you know, go online and, 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 and have a look at the trailer for 50. It's a film about four Nigerian women who are dealing with their own particular issues and challenges in life. They are all modern day. It's the modern day Nigerian woman. It's a coming of age story. No doubt we all have our challenges. You know the strength of a woman. She gets up in the morning. She's looking absolutely amazing. But you do not know the trials that she's had to deal with before she got on that particular stage. You do not know what my trials were before I got on stage this morning. And that is the journey of 50. A popular saying that I also coined, and it is, if you can think it, you can do it. Everything that we do in life starts with a thought. Let's begin to think it so we can start to do it. Thank you very much.